This is Dr. Ruben Chen, and welcome to the Vital Signs Podcast. Hi, this is Dr. Ruben Chen. Uh, welcome to another Vital Signs Podcast. And uh, today we have a very special guest here today. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Ron Kaiser. And he has a very unique uh, specialty in his field of study, specifically designed at aging and especially uh, mental aging. Is that correct or am I I getting that off? Uh, It's kind of all combined. I think the mental health and physical health really goes hand in hand. And, you know, it all kind of starts with the mindset. Yeah. So can can you uh, just... Uh, share a little bit about your background and how you got into this uh, field of aging study. Sure. For several decades, I've really been involved in health psychology and primarily with headache. I'm director of psychology, one of the leading headache centers in the world, the Jefferson Headache Center. And unlike a lot of other neurological disorders, I'm in a department of neurology, although I'm a psychologist, and unlike a lot of the other neurological disorders with headaches, in 90 some percent of the cases, we're really dealing with a neurochemical disorder. So it's not like there's disc damage or some kind of structural problem. So that unlike a lot of the neurological situations, headache patients can get better. And Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the big problems, one of the big challenges we face is the fact that when you're in chronic pain, and I know almost everybody gets headaches, but we're talking about people whose headaches really in, uh, impact on quality of life. It can be quite debilitating, cause people to drop out of school, uh, go on disability, and so on, that um, when you're in chronic pain, it really does not encourage you to want to do a lot of activity or risk taking and things of that nature, because very often you may find that it gets gets harder and uh, e- even a bit more painful. And yet yeah. it is very important for headache patients to not define themselves by the headache, to treat it as one thing in their lives so that they can begin to build a life apart from it and hopefully uh, be prepared to be a non-patient in the future. And then as I got older, uh, I was seeing the same thing with some of my peers that for many people, uh, reaching a certain age meant kind of the feeling of inevitable decline and doing things that uh, really don't promote healthy aging. And that bothered me because, you know, I felt pretty good as, as I was getting older. And it would bother me if, uh, you know, I, we, we, my wife and I might be going out with another couple. And I remember once she asked the guy, uh, what'd you do today? And it was like Saturday night. And he said, nothing. I'm going to do the same thing tomorrow. And it just, you know, there are things like that kind of galled me. The, the notion, I, uh, one time at dinner, I'd mention the fact that uh, if I knew how much fun, you know, older age would be, I'd have got to grown older faster. And people got mad at that as if, you know, that's, that's not true. And uh, as I started studying it more, I found that there really are a lot of things that we can do to enhance the experience of aging, enhance longevity. We don't have to inevitably decline. There's a lot of things we can't control, but uh, you want to have as much going for you as possible. And I just felt that that's an important message to get out there. And I've devoted a big chunk of my life to doing that since. I, I like actually the, because uh, I, I deal with chronic pain a lot. My, my specialty is something called physical medicine and rehabilitation. And so chronic pain is probably one of the things that I deal with the most and Um, how it can change your brain chemistry, which is sort of interesting. But I really like the, uh, your concept of not defining yourself by your ailment. And I I do see that quite a bit. Um, Well, with my patients, they'll say, well, I've got, I can't do this because I'm in, I'm in pain. Uh, But as we age, sometimes we want to give ourselves that kind of excuse. Well, I'm I'm older, I've got this problem, therefore I can't do this. 
And uh, that that's a, I, I like that perspective. It sort of turns it on its head to make it a um, like a glass half full concept instead of looking at the world as a glass half empty. Uh, yeah, there, you mentioned there, something too about healthy aging. What, how is, what is the difference between healthy aging and what we are seeing today? Right. Well, first of all, I do want to point out that there are a lot of people who are doing the right things and aging in a healthy manner. Uh, yeah. There's a substantial body of research that kind of indicates the fact that if you are making changes in three main areas, if you're making positive change in the areas of uh, health and fitness, and I break that into two areas. One is healthy eating, and secondly, uh, what I call owning your body, which combines exercise, sleep, uh, meditation, various kinds of things to maintain your body physically. So that's one or two areas. Uh, there also is the issue of keeping your mind active, staying uh, as active uh, cognitively as possible. And there, again, it's good science you know, that, that demonstrates that people can forestall any decline or not experience it at all. That, uh, you know, again, some people do the right things and it doesn't, doesn't happen right anyway, but that, that happens when you're 20 or 30, you can wind up with cancer or something that isn't yeah. of, of your doing. Um, so the intellectual functioning area is important. And one of the kind of underrated areas is the social connectedness area. I mean, there's a substantial body of research that indicates that uh, in the older age population, loneliness is right up there with obesity, smoking, a sedentary lifestyle in terms of a longevity reducer. So a healthy aging person, one of the things that I think is very important is the uh, idea of having goals that you're working toward in each of those areas. What can you do a little bit differently tomorrow in terms of how far you walk or uh, can you exercise another five minutes more? Or can you, if you're using resistant bands or weight, can you upgrade it uh, and do that for a while before you upgrade it again? Uh, you know, do you build in a certain number of pages a day that you're going to read? So I think it, it doesn't happen haphazardly. I think it's very important to have goals and to see aging as, as really kind of a job that, you know, you, uh, people who would not think of shortchanging their, their employer by, uh, you know, slacking on the job will do it in terms of their body. And, and, and that's a concern. Mm. So that's the difference between healthy and unhealthy aging. I, I like that idea about owning your body. Um, and, uh, because you can't, you've only got the one, <laughs> You can't switch it for another one, and you definitely have to take care of it. Uh, when, when you mention about um, about exercise as well and making goals and different things, I, I do feel that people, after they reach a certain age, they feel that there aren't any more goals that can be met, that they've sort of hit their peak and everything is downhill from there. How, how do you address that kind of mindset, which it, it's, it's pretty prevalent where people say, well, once you hit a certain age, it's just sort of downhill. I think that that's something I kind of picked up from, from the headache area. I would run into people who would say, you know, they've got these really severe debilitating headaches and say, they would say, you know, death would be better than this. And I'd always yeah. ask them, well, how do you know? You know, nobody <laughs> come back to experience it. And I think that I say the same thing here that, you know, how do you know that decline is inevitable unless you've challenged it and tried to, uh, you know, become the best version of yourself at that particular age? There certainly are now, uh, as opposed to when, when I was growing up, there certainly are a number of role models of people who are in advanced age or making co major contributions to the world and functioning in a, in a healthy manner. Mm -hmm. well, 
Can we go through some of the things that you had mentioned as well, those, uh, those categories of healthy aging? So uh, in the area of intellectual um, fitness, uh, what are activities that people can do to help keep that? Is it um, games or is it like crossword puzzles? I mean, what, what do you recommend as somebody ages even if they're uh, in their 30s and as they get older, I mean, what kind of intellectual activities do you feel like are going to be beneficial for people? Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out because I do believe that people need to start growing old when they're young. So I think that yeah. then becomes a, just a continuation of things that you've always been doing. Uh, one of the things that, that we know, uh, first of all, exercise is a very much related to, to the brain chemistry and you're continuing to, to function well. So exercise, sleep, the owning your body kinds of things really goes hand in hand with the intellectual functioning things. But we also know that uh, novel activities, for example, learning mm -hmm. a new language, uh, learning a new skill. And, you know, we live at a time when there's so much available to us. You know, there's stuff we can learn online without you know, leaving uh, or having to, to go down to uh, some other facility to learn it, even though that's probably better to get out if you can, it, certainly when we get through COVID. Um, but, you know, doing novel things is, is very important, uh, even from the standpoint of, you know, combing your hair with a different, with a different hand or buttoning or unbuttoning mm -hmm. your shirt with, uh, I'm right-handed doing it left-handed, uh, we do know that doing things novelly uh, is an important thing. The other is curiosity is a really important, critical uh, thing, a dynamic when, when you're getting older. You know, enjoy learning new things. If you can hmm. travel, uh, if you can mentor somebody, you know, do some things that engage the mind uh, and, you know, while th these are not just activities to get you off the street, but they are activities that strengthen the brain. So I guess I don't need to tell you. No, I 100% I, I agree, especially with the linking of physical activity and, uh, and, um, and aging. Uh, I know there, there have been studies about Alzheimer's and dementia that link physical activity uh, to um to those to those issues, but I also really like uh, the idea of doing novel things. I I, I feel like today, uh, especially young people, when they graduate from school, in their mind they're thinking, "Well, my learning is done, and now I can just you know use my my knowledge from school in whatever work that I'm doing, and I don't want to learn anything new." And uh, it, it, I agree very much. Trying something different, st starting at the beginning in something new, it, it definitely has a different feeling, a different flavor to it, and um, it can help in enhance your appreciation for things in life. Yeah, and you have to recognize the fact that uh, things aren't either A or fail. In other words, if mm -hmm. you're trying something new, you're probably not going to be all that good at it, you know. If you, <laughs> yeah, if you haven't done art or whatever it may be. Uh, you probably are going to uh, make mistakes if, if you think in those terms, or at least not be perfect. And again, if something that isn't an A is, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of us grew up in school recognizing or thinking, geez, if it isn't a, an A, then it's a fail. The grade may say B or C, but in our mind it was a fail. And, and we can't do that when we're learning new material. Yeah, yeah, that's just not reality. Um, what you had mentioned about physical activity. Um, what is, what do you think is proper physical activity that aids in aging? Uh, people go on walks, but I, I know I've seen some of your talks and you talk about uh, doing quite physical activity, maybe even lifting weights, things that most people will say like, ah, you know, that's, that's not for me.
but uh, I've seen some of your uh, on your website, and you do you do quite physical activity. So, what do you recommend as like physical activity? What should people be looking for for healthy aging? In general, there are three types of physical activity that that you want to be doing some of, uh, mm-hmm. and. One is the the kind of aerobic cardio activity like walking or swimming uh, or, you know, if you're if you're a jogger, I've had a hip replaced and uh, I tore my ACL playing basketball before we knew how to find what it was. So I was in this full leg cast when in my 20s uh, for for a while. So I, I don't jog anymore, but I do walk for 45 minutes a day. Um, but things like walking, swimming, the, the aerobic cardio activities. Second thing is flexibility activities to build in stretching kinds of stuff. That, uh, and there's a lot of books on it, a lot of uh, you, things you can catch online. Uh, yoga classes, which are available in the community and online or Pilates. Uh, and then uh, you mentioned lifting weights. I mean, that is actually very good in terms of uh offsetting arthritis that we do recommend that at least twice a week that you do some resistance type activities and yeah you probably can't um, lift the same level of weight that you might have when you were younger and it's there's a question that I uh, encourage my patients and and people that I coach to ask themselves and that's you know what does this have to do with me so if you go to the gym and you see somebody lifting uh or you know bench pressing or uh you know leg pressing you know hundreds of pounds and you can't um what does that have to do with you 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 don't know what that person's background is you don't know what their home life is you just want to become the best version of yourself and I think that at, at every age, and it's a lot easier. That, that's one of the reasons to start growing older when you're young is it's a lot easier if you're just continuing but modifying some activities that you were doing before. But those are the three areas, the cardio, uh, stretching, and, and resistance type exercise. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, I um, Stretching is, is one. Uh, range of motion that is something i feel is you know especially with guys is something that gets overlooked (laughs) um i i feel like i've lost quite a bit of flexibility myself and um my wife actually what when we first got married i was much more flexible than she was and now she has surpassed me because she gave herself these little goals of stretching um every time we exercise and i always thought you know whatever you know that's it's not for me and i would just do my weightlifting and whatnot and now she's more flexible than i am and she, and i feel like that flexibility has aided with a lot of some of the, her uh low back pain that she was having before and it definitely has encouraged me to do more improving my own range of motion, which is something I definitely have neglected. Yeah, I know it's, uh, it's a very common thing uh, for, for guys, especially, um, especially if we're busy and goal oriented and all that. And I always uh, used to think of, of stretching as kind of uh, the equivalent of raking leaves. Um, I don't know. <laughs> If you have leaves around there that need raking, yeah. when we used to live in the suburbs uh, until about six years ago, we now live in, in a building in the city and you may hear the once a month that they do some kind of testing. If you can hear background noise, they, they must have known we were going to do this recording. But when I uh, lived in the suburbs, I would rake leaves and then the next night the wind would come and, the you know, or it would rain and there would be leaves there again. And I, I used to think of stretching the same way. It's not, you know, if, if I'm walking or when I used to run and so on, I know if I improve my time, I know if I, uh, I you know, if, if I can go further, if I'm lifting weight, I know I, if I'm doing more stretching is kind of stretching. And uh, 
but that's kind of the same thing as you know eating and sleeping and may not be dramatic but it's really important for you yeah it, it's um actually I, i've implemented a new range of motion uh part into my workout routine and i'm sort of shocked at how bad i have been but um you know it is just something one of those things that you just need to do just like adding oil to your gas tank it just or um to your engine block and you just need to do it to keep everything running smoothly in your car um and you also mentioned about diet and this is an area i know that gets hotly contest contested uh but what what do you feel for somebody who wants to age well what kind of a diet is is good for that okay uh i'm going to answer it but i also do want to mention with respect to uh you know the the notion of stretching and, and all that yeah. kind of stuff that it i mentioned in my book if if a man wants to really become humble uh take a yoga class with an average <laughs> because they just, you know, they, they do that stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and I thought, because I was in, in the gymnastics but when I was younger, I thought, you know, I'd be pretty good at it. And uh, like I said, take a class with an average group, look over at some of the women, and uh, it, it's how you get, get humble. Um, but with respect to diet, I think, you know, I mean, obviously there's you can be bombarded with things like this and uh i think in general what's worked for me is is largely mediterranean diet i think that there uh is probably more support for that than a lot of other diets i know that uh you know that we have to deal with things like people who are gluten free we have you know these various kinds of diets you can always uh whatever diet it is, you can find somebody to swear by it uh, and somebody else to say that you're damaging your body by doing that. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think more important than that, I think, is the notion of setting goals uh, in terms of healthy eating so that it becomes more of a lifestyle. So mm -hmm. for uh, example, I think if you eat, uh, if you eat dessert uh, as a normal part of dinner, then I would tend to start out by moderating it, moderating it by not doing it one day a week. Um, if uh, mm. you, I, I generally choose to, I don't know what your point of view is on, on intermittent fasting, uh, but I, gen I don't eat between dinner and breakfast. So I, I do a 12 hour intermittent fast that I worked up to. I think the, the anti-snacking behavior is the important is one of the most important things so that if you're going to take something as a snack number one eat it only in the kitchen number two when you take something whether it be say potato chips and i i, I uh, admit to liking potato chips but i limit myself to four at a time and then i have to close up the package put it on the cupboard and close the cupboard. So I actively have to violate my rule if I'm going to, uh, you know, take more as opposed to sitting there watching TV and having a bowl of whether it be chips, candy, or whatever it may be. So I think the behaviors and the lifestyle is uh, very uh, critical. And some of the stuff becomes self-rewarding. Um, I know, for example, in my case, uh, when COVID hit, and suddenly, instead of having to go someplace to get something to eat, uh, it was like right in the next room. And I, mm -hmm. uh, after a while, I gained about three or four pounds. And uh, I, I said, that, that kind of sucks. That's not what I want. And so I, I implemented certain strategies for me, again, staying fairly close to Mediterranean diet, doing the intermittent fasting, uh, rotating in protein shakes for lunch on certain days. And I now weigh 19 pounds less than I was at my height of that. Uh, and oh. I feel better, you know, and I don't miss it. So it's, uh, yeah. you know, I, I happen to be uh, 
in our in our the headache center office today, and uh, one of the one of the uh, administrative people was leaving, and they had somebody came and told me, you know, after uh, you know, head down to the conference room. There's both chocolate cake and vanilla cake, and it had absolutely no appeal to me. Whereas, you know, at one time I figured, geez, if I don't get there, somebody else is going to get it. There won't be any left when I try. So that if you start taking the clue from when you're hungry uh, and you'll be hungry less if you have a structure to your, to your lifestyle. Oh, I, I definitely like that. Um, creating simple goals. I guess your COVID-19 went the other way. Uh, a lot of people <laughs> gain, gain 19 during this time. And um, do you, do you recommend supplements for people? I mean, what, what um, if somebody you mentioned uh, protein shakes and such. So do you, um, do you have any recommendations for that? Well, I personally take some supplements. Uh, I know of no, and I know there are controversies that if you get, if you eat well enough that you don't need them. I know of no real widespread evidence to suggest that there's any downside to taking a multivitamin and mineral. And then I think that, uh, uh, well, number one, I, I believe it's important to have a wellness oriented physician, not somebody who is just interested in treating the disease and then getting you back to normal, but rather to get your maximized functioning. And I think there are uh, th things that, that can be beneficial on an individual basis. So I generally encourage people, number one, I think there's no downside to multivitamin and mineral. Secondly, consult with your physician, assuming that he or she is, is wellness oriented. And I know, for example, mm -hmm. again, where I've had a couple of joint issues, I do take glucosamine. Uh, there are some things I've uh, taken during, during the pandemic that may or may not be uh, that uh, appropriate for everybody, but I do take a probiotic. I take extra C, um, and uh, that's about it. But I, again, I, 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 it's not a major part of my training. Uh, you know, I learn about it adjunctively, and I do have um, uh, some certification uh, in uh, in in nutrition, but not as a registered dietitian or anything like that. Uh, so. You know, again, if you got a good doctor, listen to him or her and discuss it with them. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I'm uh, I'm a very pro doctor shopping type of guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, if you don't have if this is the thing that I hear is that people complain about their doctors. And I will always just say you probably should get a new one then <laughs> mm -hmm. because um, that's that's very true um, as a physician myself. Um, Doctors come in all kinds and you just need to find the one that fits for you and it's helping you find, uh, helping you reach the best goals in your life. So I, I agree with that very much. Yeah, and I um, absolutely think when you're, when you're going through the aging process that um, it's just critically important to, uh, I, well, as you may suspect, I come from a positive psychology orientation, which is not to go from disease to neutral and then we forget about it. But I think wellness is so important. And, uh, you know, uh, when I started uh, with, it's been probably 15 years with uh, a, a physician who would ask me how many days a week I eat red meat and how many days I eat fish and how many days I exercise and do I work up a sweat when I do it and uh, you know all that stuff seemed to coalesce and make a lot of sense for me and I just think you know it's it's important to to recognize that there's, there's that not all doctors are the same and you got to find the one that that fits for you you, but I just think it's, uh, there are very few rights and wrongs in the world, but I think it's totally wrong to not have a wellness oriented physician. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, sure and I also like that, that you've mentioned uh, as we participate in the aging process. Um, what, what do you mean by participate in the aging process? Well, first of all, when, when a child is born, they start doing two things right away. They start breathing, they start aging. So that mm -hmm. what we're going through at this point, it's just a different phase of the process. Um, and I think that we have to look at that as now, unfortunately, in society, uh, we've kind of built in a couple of artificial things. One is called retirement, which kind of assumes that, uh, you know, you reach a certain point and then you, you're excused from producing and excused from taking care of yourself. Now that might have made sense when Social Security came out because when, when it was first passed, because I believe uh, the average lifespan was 61 years at that time. Yeah. Uh, that's a little bit distorted because you had more childhood deaths or deaths due to childhood illnesses. You know, so there were, there were people who lived into their 70s and 80s and so on. But that was the average and social security kicked in at 65 right from the beginning so that the odds were that you wouldn't have to do very much planning uh, for you know beyond retirement so i think that but that's an artificial thing especially now where we have you know so much better nutrition so much more knowledge of this area um i don't know if you're aware Ruben, there's a uh, there are a couple of geriatric professors who made a bet uh, that ultimately uh, one of their heirs is going to be maybe a billionaire by the time the interest builds up and so on. I think they started with hundreds of dollars. But one say, is saying that the first person to live to be 150 and with a, uh, with a functioning mind is... Mm -hmm. is alive today and the other took the other side of the bet not because he thinks it won't happen but it won't happen that soon um hmm. and you know, there are a number of uh prominent people in the field uh walter bortz uh, among others who you know says the the typical or the outer lifespan right now is 120 and that 100 should be routine so that instead of this artificial thing, I think you've got uh, getting to be 60, 65, 70 and preparing to wow. decline. You've got to be thinking about, geez, how do I want to live the next three or four decades? And, uh, you know, if you, make don't make 65, it, you don't make it. Yeah, they make 65 the new middle age. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's kind of like midlife at some point. Yeah. And, that, and there is this type of stress for people as uh, young people get going in their career that they only have a, a very short period of time to be productive. And um, I mean, um, you're, you're obviously still very productive. You've got books, you've got podcasts, and, um, and you're, and you're, evolving with the times as well. I, I think that uh, definitely should, you know, change our perspective about aging and how many years of productivity we really have. Um, uh, especially if you're going to be living into 120 years old and you retire at the age of 65. That's, I mean, that's, that's a long time to, to still be alive and be totally doing nothing except for watching television. So, yeah, no. yeah, except if you're doing that, you probably won't last uh, as long as somebody who is being productive. Yeah. Do you, so do you agree with retirement age at, at 65 or what is your what is your perspective on that? I, I think that everything is an individual decision. I think that you have to factor in several things. Number one, do you like what you're doing? Uh, mm -hmm. If you hate what you're doing and you've got to a pension that may be a different perspective than some of us. And, and a lot of, I mean, I, I'm certainly one of the older people on the faculty who I work, but I'm not the only guy that's, you know, up there in, 
in age uh, because most of us enjoy what we're doing and you know we see new groups of uh, interns, residents, and so on. And we, so we're exposed to the brightest young people in the world. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what else would be as exciting. So, you know, uh, but I recognize that, that for other, I mean, it's the same thing you can ask, uh, you know, Warren Buffett. I mean, he's, look at what he's doing in its yeah. 90s and his partner, I think, is older. Um, the, you know, so... I, I think it's an individual thing. The critical thing, though, I, I go back to, you know, health and fitness, intellectual functioning and social connectedness, and to be able to make changes in the four main areas of healthy eating, uh, to uh, own your body, to own your mind, and to stay socially connected, and to have goals in that direction. Uh, on some of my online courses, I encourage people, no matter what age, to, in, in addition to having short-term goals, to have a 10-year goal. I think everybody has to have a 10-year goal because that's kind of an insurance policy against, you know, decline if you've got goals to aim for. Hmm. I like that. A 10-year goal. So you're always pushing towards something and not just something like next week or next month, but you're looking down the you're looking down the uh, road a bit. Uh, so, um, you mentioned also, so uh, can you, uh, I know you have a book and uh, a, a website and podcast. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about what, what is uh, on those, um, on those uh, sites? Sure. Uh, well, my book uh, is back here it's called Rejuvenating which mm -hmm. I'm proud of. It's a term that I've trademarked and registered with the U.S. Patent Office. It's called rejuvenating, and it's defined as the art and science of growing older with enthusiasm. I think enthusiasm is kind of an underrated emotion, but I think if you're enthusiastic about life, then you will proceed in a way that, again, makes, makes old age fun. Uh, so that's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Uh, uh, it, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that it's won some book awards and was for a while an Amazon bestseller. Um, my website is called The Mental Health Gym because I think that uh, for many people, what we want to do is promote mental health as kind of being the equivalent of going to the gym. And when you go to the gym, it's not just for people who are out of shape. It's not just for jocks who are in shape. Everybody is accepted because they're doing, they're, they're pursuing their own personal goal, but it's a goal of getting better in that case physically. And here is uh, where I think it's important to have the goals to get better in all those areas. So it's called the mental health gym. It's also the place where people can correspond with me. Um, there's some you know, information that always deals with positive psychology, wellness, the thing that I developed called goal achieving psychology. Um, and the website is being upgraded. So it'll look a little, little more, uh, more modern, I guess is the, the best. Uh, term. And then my podcast is, uh, it's called Rejuvenating with Dr. Ron Kaiser. It's really designed for all ages. And we bring in, uh, every once in a while, I do a solo episode, but in most cases, we bring in guests who leave their own lives with enthusiasm and have different ways of helping other people to do so. And uh, so wherever you are in life, we, we hope that it'll be a a practical kind of thing. And it, we drop a new one every Tuesday. Mm, wow, terrific. And, um, and it, you also have a TEDx talk that is also available on YouTube uh, that I happen to watch as well. It's also very informative where you show your pyramid and uh, of, the, of the important things in life uh, that you mentioned just now about uh, making goals at the very, very top and all of the things that support that. So if you want to check out that, um, just check them out. I think it's on, I think it's TEDx. 
on uh, on YouTube and just look up uh, yeah, yeah, Ron Kaiser. He's, yeah, it's that's right there. I put his TEDx Ron Kaiser whenever I want to see whether yeah. other people are watching. But I'm glad you mentioned the pyramid because I think that's important. The, the the pyramid actually goes from the least complex to the most complex. So social activities, which depend on other people interacting with you, is more complex than, say, for example, changing your eating patterns uh, or mm -hmm. re deciding that you're going to uh, take a class or that you're going to read for 15 minutes a day or 20 minutes a day or a half hour a day. The things that are totally dependent on you are toward the bottom. And as you build that, then you can gain uh, you know, more uh, confidence in moving further up. I had actually thought that uh, owning your body or healthy eating would be you know, kind of right, right among the easiest things to do. And uh, my editor convinced me that uh, that that's harder to start people worry about Alzheimer's and stuff like that get to that first and let them get a little bit of confidence uh, before taking on you know trying to lose weight or, or exercise mm -hmm. yeah I, I can understand that perspective but um, I think your perspective is that there's no um, people are in this mentality of decline and they want to prevent decline as much as they can and keep what they have. And your perspective is um, there's, you know, some things will change, but to embrace that change and there are new things, new avenues that you can continue to open for yourself as you move forward. So there's never this concept of decline and, and losing what you have, but you can always, you're actually gaining more as you get older and as you have more experiences and uh, as you're creating more goals for yourself. I think that that's, that's it's a, it's a, it definitely is, a, it's a change in mentality, I think for a lot of people. And I think it's very valuable. Yeah, well, it's the same as, as, you know, anything else in life. I mean, you can fear cold water and never learn to swim or you can, uh, <laughs> fear riding a roller coaster and miss out on one of the you know real joys of childhood i mean there are you can approach things as either something to fear or something to embrace and particularly if you've led a kind of fearful life and you're fearing uh you know going forward what what do you got to lose because you know that the worst that can happen is is something that's likely to happen unless you do something to change the circumstances. And, you know, you've got that opportunity. It just, I, I think it's, it's, it's a pretty easy choice to make. Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely recommend, I, I have a copy of the book as well. I just started reading it and I'm a couple of chapters in, but um, I recommend checking out the book. And also going to see uh, to your website and checking out your TEDx talk as well. Um, so anyways, uh, Dr. Kaiser, thank you. Thank you for your time and giving us this hopeful message about aging and how to, how to address it with enthusiasm. I like that. So, and um, yeah. Um, well, also for, for anybody who, yeah, thank you. And uh, again, uh, this uh, is our Vital Signs podcast. Uh, if you guys want to know more also about Sunrider, uh, you can see us at sunrider.com, www.sunrider.com. And talking about uh, aging and experience, this is our 40th anniversary year. So we're inviting everybody to our uh, 40th anniversary convention this September. You can check out uh, the information on our website and hope to see everybody there. Anyways, uh, again, thank you for your time, uh, Dr. Kaiser. And I, I do recommend everybody check out uh, his uh, book and his website is a lot of good information there. Okay. You, All right. Thank you very much. Bye.